Welcome to the Revenue Lounge Podcast. My name is Jordan, and in today's episode, we will be talking about the building blocks of a revenue operations team and how to go about setting it up. Today with us, we have Darren Fay. Darren is the Director of Revenue Operations and Intelligence at Instructure. Darren, would you like to introduce yourself and tell us about your role in the team at Instructure? Yeah. Uh, again, my name is Darren Fay, and Director of Revenue Operations and Intelligence at Instructure. And my team supports the sales organization, and we support the system side and administration of our sales tech stack, as well as the business intelligence arm, uh, which also supports our dashboarding strategy and insights. Thank you for joining us today. Just kind of diving in, how did you start at Instructure, and how did you move to your current role? Yeah, um, I originally uh, jumped into RevOps from going to back into sales a um, number of years ago, where I worked for a company, Sprint corporate, which they don't exist anymore. <laughs> They're now T-Mobile. <laughs> but um, while I was with them, I led a sales uh, and operations team. And, uh, you know, I, I love doing that. I, I have a passion for sales and I have a passion for operations uh, through that that lens. And uh, I had a friend who left uh, the company and went to a SaaS company, he went to Domo, gave me a call and said, hey, you know, you need to come check out SaaS. I think you'll enjoy it. And uh, decided to make the move because I loved working with this person and um, we were we used to compete uh, in sales quite a bit together. Uh, jumped into a sales role over at uh, Domo and then from there got uh, headhunted to build a business development team and a uh, revenue operations team over at Clarivine, a smaller uh, tech startup. And uh, from there moved over to Instructure where um, I'm sitting in my role that I'm at today. You know, I have a joke when I look back at my career that the only time I entered data in Salesforce was when I was not doing my job. I don't know if that resonates, but when you got into RevOps, how did how was that transition, especially leading a team that's responsible for entering data and then, you know, the team that's responsible for the architecture and CRM? Yeah, you know, I think it's a unique perspective. I do think almost everyone who at least sits in like a BI or more strategy related role in RevOps should, would benefit from carrying a bag. Um, you know, I think you understand the people you're service, serving more, so you're in, like end user and customer. And uh, having the opportunity to focus in on the experience that, it, that a sales rep goes through and how to optimize that process and, you know, lead to, to more revenue through, uh, you know, operationalizing the way they do their business. And, you know, if you come at it from just a, a standard systems approach, you're looking at purely from, you know, prioritization of the different requests you get and things of that nature. And you get stuck in this operational framework rather than focusing on the impacts on the business, which is where sales spends the majority of their time. And for Instructure specifically, you've stood up a BI team as part of your RevOps org. Yeah, we have, in Instructure, we have, um, our organization is led by uh, a uh, senior vice president of revenue operations, uh, Joanna Finkhauser. And the way we have that uh, organization split out is we have an arm for uh, sales, customer um, success or customer experience, renewals and marketing. And uh, from there, we have our business intelligence leaders that are running those uh, arms of those businesses. And from there, they have uh, systems teams that report into them. And think of it as uh, somebody who the BI team and strategy team are the people who spend time with their uh, end customer, which is like the heads of their departments. They understand what's going on. They understand the strategy. They understand what's driving the business. And then they make recommendations or they make uh, operational decisions that the system team carries out and builds processes around. I might jump ahead of myself here, but that's a really interesting model that you have, it, it seems like something that most companies don't mature to for a while. Uh, there's a example from HP a few years back where they talked about the need to start from the data science side because as those frontline leaders make requests or you you know bring things in from a marketing ops or sales ops or CS, CS ops perspective, th those can have significant impacts on the downstream ability to report out. How has that workflow been for your team being that embedded from a BI perspective with those frontline leaders and, and customers? I think it's uh, optimal, right? I think you, with um, leading from basically your EC and your board and you understand what's important to them and you understand what those leaders are um, marching to, right? What, what gets measured gets inspired. And the business, uh, first and foremost, is measuring uh, 
uh, KPIs such as like bookings or retention rate or things along those lines. Now those business unit, um, leaders care about those areas. And so the BI person is focused uh, solely on making sure we get the proper insights and uh, to understand what's going on with the business to uh, make recommendations and understand how they can fix you know, uh, headwinds we're having or obstacles that are coming uh, in front of each department. And at that point, you can take those insights and you can help develop an operational framework that can help solve some of those issues. Um, or, you know, you can make sure that you're just always keeping focused on impact, right? I think in RevOps, you can get really stuck in, hey, I have all these tasks that I need to do. I have these things that need to happen. But at the end of the day, you know, what's driving the impact of the business? Because at the end of the day, a revenue operations team, you know, they are an expense on the line, right? So you need to make sure that you are um, offering uh, value for your services, which is going to be measured by the impacts you're bringing to the business. That's a great point. And RevOps, you know, if we rewound, I guess, to, you know, 2020 or, you know, in this current, current era we're in, RevOps has evolved pretty quickly as a function or an idea to combine all revenue facing teams. How, how do you personally define revenue operations or, or kind of view that journey? I look at it as like a management model, right? That, that aligns, you know, marketing to sales, to customer success operations that um, span across the full customer life cycle. So um, historically, what you used to have before revenue operations, you have like a sales operations team, CX operations, or CS operations back in the day, marketing operations. And then they would go to a boardroom and they would go talk about like their metrics and they would say, hey, you know, I, a marketing team would say, I, I'm delivering a hundred, um, you know, opportunities over to sales and sales would say, well, no, I only received, you know, 95. And then they'd say, okay, well, what'd you convert, right? And then the sales team would say, oh, well, we converted 10 of those. And then CX would say, well, I only received nine. And the disconnect was be between the silos of each department. And somebody was, would say, you know, I'm defining or quantifying the, the data in this way. And that's why there's a difference between how we report it out or how we define the strategy of the business. So putting them all under a single uh, department is highly beneficial for, you know, an organization to stay aligned across all the ways that they measure their KPIs and, and measurements. Okay. And my next question was going to be about roles and structure on a team, but along with that, with those roles, so you're, you're pulling in those traditional roles that maybe, you know, on their, in their own created those, those siloed gaps. In your case, you also have this BI team. What are, do you run into some of the traditional, how do I put this, like pet peeves between those roles and functions? And, you know, we're, as we're in this transition from traditional architecture to a RevOps architecture. Yeah, you're always going to run into that. But the way you can mitigate it is by focusing on, you know, one of the methodologies I really like, um, I was introduced to it by my boss, um, Joanna at, my, at Instructure, and I decided to go get certified in it and really dive in and both, you know, both feet into the water on OKRs and understanding OKRs and how they, they should be driving a business, right? So, you know, if you, if you follow a top-down approach of OKR methodology where you say, hey, the executive team, we're going to ask them to set their OKRs. And then you say from there, those department leaders are going to develop their OKRs that nest within the um, greater organization's OKRs. If, if you nest yours along with your department leaders, right, and you're continually focusing on what matters, the pet peeves or what's important or what's getting in the way between each person's scope kind of melts away because everyone's focused on a unified goal um, of achieving those OKRs from each department. And so, um, you know, I think that's the best way to mitigate it and go, go through it. But um, I would say you're always going to have those interpersonal moments, but I think as long as you focus on the out, the uh, outputs and the, the um, deliverables and what's your, the highest priority, you should be okay. I grew up with MBOs and, and, uh, when I was introduced to OKRs a couple of years ago, I, 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 they make a lot of sense. Now you're at the center and you're building these relationships with these, you know, internal customers and teams. What are some of the tips and tricks you have for taking OKRs and keeping teams aligned with an organization around, you know, an OKR structure? And, and I guess one question is how new are OKRs, you know, for the other people that you're supporting? Like how much enablement do you need to do? 
Yeah, I think initially when we rolled out OKRs, it was um, fairly new, right, to, to the majority of people, not the EC or the senior leadership team, but for the majority of the the team members uh, who report into myself or other areas of you know operations org. Um, you know, I found understanding uh, the training of it. So, you know, I, I finished my certification on it and I put together training for, you know, our revenue operations organization to share out and make sure I can enable people to really understand the value and break it down into bite-sized chunks. But, you know, simplifying it down to, you know, the area of an objective, right? You, you look at an objective and understand what you're wanting to accomplish and those key results that you're setting from a department level, you're going to have your own key results that feed into that. And then from there, you know, the principle OKRs are always going to be different at, at each business, but the principle I, I like that we are using right now, you know, is you take your key result and I define my key result along with the other leaders that uh, coincide with the revenue operations organization. And then we have the, our team members go through and develop the tactical plans that help deliver against that. So they own tactical portions that deliver to that key result. So without having to get somebody fully into the OKR methodology, you can still have to be, be a part of the process and help deliver value against the key results and have ownership under like individual tasks. That makes a lot of sense. One OKR nerd question. Do you, do you roll up into V2 mom as well or? Yeah. <laughs> Fellow OKR nerd. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the great, um, you know, this came up in the last podcast is the uh, measure what matters books and, and uh, OKRs here. It's, it's a great system. It helps keep everything aligned and, um, it's, it's, it's a nice uh, structure to, to build uh, goals and targets around. So in the middle of that, there will always be fire drills. You know, there, there will always be maybe somebody needs a new tool or maybe you've done a, you know, one of your objectives is a new market expansion and maybe your lead, your lead uh, decoration tool doesn't work as well. So you need to go get a region-specific tool. How do you ensure that your RevOps team can remain agile and, you know, fulfill those, those customer requests as they, they come up from the frontline leaders. Yeah. I think what's really important is, um, developing a roadmap, right? You, you have a roadmap, you set the roadmap. Um, and there's three things that I, I like to keep it simple. So with, with my roadmap items, so, um, we use Asana, so we use like a project management uh, tool. And one of the things that I like to do is I like to have my roadmap. I like to have my weekly deliverables, and then I also like to have a requests section in, within there. In the request section, I always I ask for three things. I ask who's requesting it, what is the request like for, like why are they requesting it, and then um, what's the impact on the business. And I think those three things allow us to understand what's the priority, and how can we uh, quantify the impact on the business to determine if it should be a higher priority or a lower priority. You know, you may have who requests it be an EC member or something along those lines that could, you know, trump something. But I, I believe in your roadmap being fluid. So, you know, you establish your roadmap. A after you've established your roadmap, you leave that uh, published. And I publish mine publicly for um, my organization so people can easily access and understand where our priorities lie. And then from there, you know, you, you look at new requests that comes in that come in and you say, OK, well, first and foremost, these are our OKRs. These are the things that we're marching against and these are our top priorities. So we want to align with what's important to the business and start there. And um, at that point, if something new comes in and we need to reevaluate, we look at that against what we have and we bubble that up to senior leadership and then even further and say, hey, listen, if we have this request that comes in. If we do put this in the roadmap, it could push these requests out. The downstream impact and you know quantifying that impact for them on how it could delay uh, another deliverable or it could impact bookings or it could impact another area of the book uh, of the business allows us to really you know determine what should be on the roadmap or what should be taken off and you know the good thing about revenue operations is you're never going to have a short list of things that need to be done right you're always going to have some exhaustive list and at the end of the day it's about how, what's more important to tackle now and what needs to be built out and at the end of the day when you knock something off that list, you're always going to have something file back into it. So you need to maintain, you know, fluidity across the, across your roadmap. I feel like we could probably spend an hour talking about agile and project management with, uh, with that. I love that you brought up Asana. A lot of times, you know, probably over the last five years for me, I've seen 
people bring in tools like Asana and then try to bring in people to make those tools work. I'm going to guess that both you and I will have similar thoughts on that. The question is, as you look at building out a RevOps team versus a, maybe a traditional sales ops, marketing ops team, what's kind of the best time in terms of, you know, series A, B, C, and employee size to build out a revenue ops, revenue ops team and be strategic about it? Oh man, I, I think as soon as possible. Um, I don't think you necessarily have to build a whole team around it, but I think you start, um, you, sh- you should build a, f- have a framework for re- a revenue operations organization and early stage, you know, seed or series A, you know, somebody's going to be wearing multiple hats, right? You're never going to have somebody just focus on revenue operations, but um, you know, if you have someone focusing on revenue operations, you know, they should have the capability of understanding the base concepts of sales, uh, marketing and customer success and be eager to kind of um, a good listener to, to talk to those uh, business leaders and say, hey, listen, this is what's important to me and start cataloging that to build out what should be the, uh, the forefront of their mind and making sure that they start focusing on scalability because there's nothing worse than coming into an organization and saying, okay, okay, great. We have all these bad habits. We need to erase every one of them and then start building something new that'll work. That's a really good point. It's uh, it's <laughs> burnt. Letting the forest fire happen and then re, replanting is, uh, I, I see that happen too often. So on that note, w- we start talking about change management. You know, for those companies that are in the middle of ripping out bad habits, what kind of change management tips and tricks do you have for, you know, teams that are trying to pivot towards something that's more strategic and more thoughtful? If you're an existing team, how do you get buy-in from stakeholders or where do you get buy-in from new, new people bringing in ideas from something that worked in the past? Yeah, I think, um, you know, when you're trying to build out a revenue operations organization, you're always going to have one person who is an executive sponsor who wants to have somebody in RevOps because right now it's a buzz term. Everyone wants to be, everyone wants a revenue operations function. But it, it, the key is to finding somebody who's active and uh, visible in terms of an executive sponsor who's willing to help champion uh, initiatives. But then you also need to be, um, someone who's willing to contribute to their, their, their ability to be a, a sponsor, right? So you can't just ask them to be a sponsor without uh, justification. And I think when you look at um, coming to organiz- an organization and trying to build something out, the proof is in the pudding, right? I think the, the thing that people get away from in revenue operations is they say, oh, oh we, we don't necessarily want to commit to impacting bookings because how do we directly impact that? Well, um, I, I think we the best thing for revenue operations is to get in front of that and say, you know what, I want to be in front of that because that's what's driving the impact, which is going to help deliver more value. And it's going to help justify the ability to build out those organizations. So, um, you know, after you develop your executive sponsor, um, I would say understanding what's important to the EC and the board and listening. And, um, you, you know, you're likely, you likely won't have OKRs at a smaller company. They might not have that function going. It might not be that mature. And so, um, maybe influencing that and saying, hey, I, this is what I need to be successful. These are the um, the guidance I need around what's important to help to, to deliver um, a plan that's in alignment with an alignment um, to the company's overall objectives. And then, you know, making sure you're an active listener to the frontline employees because they're the ones that are going to be in, influencing the best way to go about solving those problems or, you know, the, the things that um, are getting in their way to help, you know, lead to the impact and the, the growth of the company. And then once you've done all that, you build a structure uh, around it and say, hey, this is how we're going to go about it. And then make sure you maintain transparency and you communicate often um, or on your milestones and your business impacts. And you do so clearly and um, make sure you document it and you're very loud about um, what's going on in the business. And to me, that's how you manage the change management. As I heard you walk through that, I was thinking <laughs> the, the amount of times enablement or ops where sales or you know customer facing employee will will question um the back office because you know have you spent time with the customer but the reality is that that internal selling that you have to do that consultative process and even that in, internal sales process to as you said build a you know sp- executive sponsor it takes a lot of work like it, the the amount of time that you put into decks and planning and developing budgets it's it's not too dissimilar from, you know, what people are doing on the front line, especially with a kind of a SaaS value selling motion. Yeah, I think people are so busy in RevOps for the most part, trying to just deliver that sometimes they lose sight of um, delivering, you know, the communication of the value as well. 
um, outside of just delivering the project itself. That's a great point. I've seen a lot of emails from RevOps that are paragraph points of what's been accomplished and and it, and watched sales leaders, you know, kind of eyes closed. <laughs> I can say that. I guess, do you have an I, ICP for, you know, who the RevOps should report into? And it feels like increasingly, you know, it's kind of a CFO driven, driven initiative. Yeah, you know, um, I think it's something that should be very fluid for an organization because I, I, the way I believe it is that I think it should be somebody who has a dog, in, you know, a dog in the fight for each department. So somebody who um, cares about the marketing production as well as the sales and as well as the customer success. But I also think um, the main point is it shouldn't live in one of those departments, right? Because if it lives in one of those departments, you have one uh, champion that is going to always focus more on their department uh, rather than the rest of the departments. Right. And, you know, ideally um, earlier companies don't usually have um, a COO arm right away. That's it's usually started with like a CFO and a CEO. And that's usually the first two executives that come on board. Um, then you may have like a chief legal officer that comes on board after or something along those lines, things that help build the business quickly. And I think that's why you might see it in a CFO earlier on, which I think is definitely okay. And I think um, the the I, I prefer to see it more roll into a CEO role, in my opinion, though, rather than a CFO role, because the CEO role is going to be more focused on okay, what's the product? Uh, what's going on with the customer the customer lifecycle, the customer journey, and a lot of that's going to be impacted by revenue operations uh, decisions. And if you're focused on a CFO um, role. Typically, you know, that CFO is going to have something that's up, uh, of the utmost importance to him. It's going to be around revenue and it'll be around dollars. And you could lose sight on what's important, which is the customer base. But um, preferably if the company has a COO, I think a COO role is where it should live. I love that point. I mean, rewinding 20 years to business school, it's finance operations and those just haven't changed. And I feel like RevOps is part of the maturity of this space that's hasn't had a, a solid place to sit. And, and BI, candidly, to bring it back to the top, part of that, uh, you know, my years as a business analyst, it, it wasn't clear where that role would actually sit. Yeah, I think a lot of companies suffer from that same thing, right? It's, hey, I'm going to drop them where I can, where I have the stronger leader um, who can drive some of the initiatives. Whereas, you know, in some cases, you know, I've been reading the, the book is owned to win um by jeffrey moore and um they talk about basically a, a lot of principles around operations and one of which is you know when you have a, a transformation zone is one, one of the principles they have in there one of the zones that they cover and it's the of the utmost importance and so that rolls into the ceo and the ceo carries that that weight and i think a lot in a lot of cases revenue operations um should align if there is not a ceo or there is not somebody who is mutually aligned to all those departments you know it should align with like, let's say a CEO, in my opinion. We'll have some rapid fire fun questions here in a second, but my kind of final big question here is, what are some of the traits you think uh, make a great RevOps professional and who should consider it or maybe self-assess and, and, and not go into RevOps? Yeah, um, like the, I'd say some, basically the ideal candidate, is, is that what you're asking? The, somebody who's curious, um, and I, I think also somebody who has the um, appetite for uh, strategy and somebody who is um, a able to manage uh, a complex process. I think you, you think through the ideal candidate of somebody, you're never going to have the opportunity where you're looking at um, a single person who's going to be able to handle every single thing that comes at them, right? What you need is somebody who's adaptable. So somebody who can understand this is a problem. This is how, how, how can we solve it? How can we understand all the issues surrounding it? Which is funny enough, it's a very um, great sales um, trait. People who are really good at sales, they're consultative. They listen, they dig deep into understanding what's going on to offer up a solution. It's a more strategic. And you know, somebody from an operations side, I think the ideal candidate can see those things and dive deep enough to understand what the solution should be. And then also be uh, nimble enough to say, hey, I'm gonna recommend this, we might need to adjust based on additional feedback. And then at that point, you know, still willing to continue to learn because in revenue operations, let's say you're out of the job for two years, you become irrelevant um, fairly quickly. And, you know, things change very fast. So um, 
somebody who's um, constantly maintaining you know, their professional development, I think is really key. I've noticed that myself. I had a Salesforce uh, administrative certificate. And then when lightning hit, the questions I was getting from our CS ops team, I was so out of scope on the functionality of what was required for lightning. That... Yeah, it changes in a blink of an eye these days with the systems we use. It's great, but yeah, it keeps you on your toes. And... Here's the rapid fire questions. So, and I think I think you just mentioned this. What's one book that you would recommend recommend people to read or that you've loved? Uh, I'm going to give you two. Uh, you know, one of them, which would be like your personal growth. Um, I feel like crucial conversations is like transformed my career. I uh, just the ability to have those difficult conversations. Um, and then most recently, I really loved Zone to Win um, by Jeffrey Moore. And I think, you know, that one focuses, he's the author of Crossing the Chasm. So like a lot of startup people have read that book, but when you're at a larger, more established business, Zone to Win is like the book for that, right? And how to uh, maintain staying relevant and things like that. And there's a lot of really great strategies um, around how to manage the business operationally and, and build the plans around it. Crucial conversations and zone to win. We'll we'll make sure we put that in the notes. Uh, thank you. What's your favorite part of working in RevOps? I'd say the variety and um, the ability to impact not just one area of a business. Um, you know, in revenue operations, you can touch every single aspect of that business in one way or another. Sales, you you impact revenue or you impact you know set, just overall sales. Um, marketing, it's, you know, lead generation or pipeline generation, CX, it's customer success in terms of like net promoter scores or things of that nature. But in revenue operations, you have your fingers in just about anything and you can really understand the business from like, you know, a 3000 foot view and really get into it. Perfect. And how about your least favorite part? Um, managing continually changing priorities. <laughs> You know, it, it's, um, you can get good at it, but it's never going to be fun. <laughs> yeah. It's, I mean, you go to OKRs and it's, I can't tell you how many times I've had to try. It, it's been a helpful structure to drive back to, okay, these, these are what we said, the objectives. Um, how does this impact those objectives? Yeah, and reminding yourself your object, your uh, key results are not your baby, right? Uh, they should be abandoned at the first sign that something else is a higher priority. And um, sometimes it's tough when you get really far down a project and you've worked really hard on something and you're like, oh, you know what? The business has changed. We need to focus on this instead. You know, if I could test people, I'd give them paper airplanes and just, you have to get used to throwing away your paper airplanes. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good way of thinking about it. Uh, who's a RevOps leader that you, you know, look up to or that has mentored you? Yeah, um, I'd, I'd say the RevOps leader that I've, I look up to, um, especially in terms of skill, would be my boss right now, uh, Joanna Fickhauser. Um She knows the business very well. Um, and her main skill set that I'm envious of is her ability to stay aligned with the, the EC um, changes, right? The EC priority shifts. It's something that you can... You know, one day it's this, the next day it's this, and the ability for her to stay aligned with that and maintain, you know, uh, the vision of the whole organization, I think is, is impressive. What's some advice you've received from someone that has, has stayed with you? I'll give you a story, um, which is like an advice in, in terms of a story. Um, there's a, you know, old man, an old man who lived on a farm in, in Japan and he had a horse and he let it out to, to graze in the field and that the horse went out and the neighbor came over to him and said, man, that's you know, that's terrible luck. You know, the horse never came back. I'm sorry. And, um, the next day the horse came back and brought two other horses with him. And his neighbor says, Oh, it, it's good luck for you. I'm really happy for you. And, um, he said, well, maybe. And, um, and the next day his son was out and breaking one of the horses in and riding it and then broke his leg. And the neighbor came over and was like, that's terrible luck. I'm, you know, I'm sorry. It's, it's awful. And he said, well, maybe. And then the next day, you know, um, the military came through town and was doing a draft and they passed up on his son because his leg was broken. And, you know, his, his neighbor came over again and he was like, man, it's really lucky. I'm, I'm happy for you. This, you know, it's great. And he says, well, maybe. And, you know, the advice that I got from that was, you know, this too shall pass, I guess is a way of uh, putting it. And all, all the bad things that can happen or the difficult times that you have, you know, through your job, those things are temporary, right? And they, they could lead to something that could be a wonderful thing for you. 
And you never know that, um, you know, that one terrible thing or one thing that you had to go through last week was actually going to lead to something you know, magical and, and transformative for your life, which is pretty cool. Yeah. That's great advice. This too shall pass. Well, I, I would encourage people to go follow you on LinkedIn and follow Joanna and, and, uh, and soak up that energy. Um, last question here. What's one piece of advice you'd have for someone who wants to be a director of revenue operations one day? Uh, I'd say remain being curious um, and, and looking into the, the business decisions that are going on around you and understand why those decisions are happening and saying, hey, listen, the, the business is making this decision. Why? What led to that decision? Um, and, you know, once that decision was made, what were they expecting? And if you don't, if you can't teach it after you've um, dove into it to understand it, you need to dig into it more, right? And I think really getting in, involved in every aspect of the business, there's always like this one thread that you pull and it leads to something else. And you really need to understand like the downstream ramifications of everything that's impacting uh, the business from the revenue operations side. Well, this, this has been great, Darren. I really appreciate your time. Those book recommendations, that advice. Um... I think it's fantastic that Instructure has a BI team attached to RevOps. It feels like you, you all are on kind of the forefront of this space and this domain. So thank you for sharing. Have a great week. Yeah, you bet. Thank you. It's been a great chat with you, Jordan.